The problem with Duolingo for you is that it's too repetitive and starts feeling more like work than fun learning the language after a while. That makes sense. And that's understandable. Uh, that is a criticism that I agree with, actually. Quite a lot. Agree with. Um, when uh, Duolingo's mechanical pace. So Duolingo's dynamic mechanical pace is very, very slow. It's incredibly slow. So it's not that you learn less. As in what I mean by that is you are exposed, you are exposed to less. So a lot of individuals say like Duolingo introduce exposes you to too few words per day or per lesson. In fact, I'm going to tell you now, if you do one lesson, it's like it's 25 to 30 things a day. The downside is if you're mechanically restricted, when you're mechanically restricted, it may feel slow because everything slows down. It's a grind, right? And I absolutely agree with that. Now, here's the thing. When you have this problem, when you have this problem, it's not unique. It's not unique to Duolingo. And I've expressed this multiple times. It's unique. Uh, it's a human condition. And one thing I've done, because I know I'm not immune to this as well, <clears throat> is I bring, I bring mechanics. I bring mechanics into Duolingo. Duolingo isn't doing these things that I'm doing now. My thoughts and stories and whatnot. So my compensation for that for certain is that if you're a literal person, which I was referring to, the literalness, if your uh, abstraction, in my opinion, and creativity is bound by the literal prov provision of a tool, then my encouragement for most people is to constantly cycle through tools. So like cycle back to a tool, cycle to a tool, uh, keep your learning process dynamic. You know, do 30 minutes of Anki, 15 minutes of Duolingo, 15 minutes of LingQ or whatever. Go to your blogs. The idea is to continuously uh, starve yourself of being too repetitious. Whatever amount of time, those weren't exact times. You have to determine when you start feeling like this is not fun anymore. It's too repetitious. So breathing, continuing to breathe new dynamics into your life and as you're in your routine will keep that uh, repetitious nature from starving you out of your motivation right and fun um generally speaking uh my intrigue in design language is what's propping my interest in duolingo as opposed to what the tool can do for me so definitely go out and Get more things, you know, get more things, get more vlogs and stuff. I, um, it is enabling the hyper stimulation thing, the hyper stimulation that YouTube and like the internet age has promoted. However, if you want to learn something and you want to feel good, generally you gauge your own level of stimulation that you require. For me, if I sit here and talk to myself for eight hours, I'm already entertained. So my threshold is a little bit different than others right so i'm not suggesting anything i do can be very reasonable to others i entertain myself sitting in the middle of a room with nothing in it <laughs> so, so when i was talking about gauging your level of abstraction abstraction and creativity um constantly looking for new tools new inspiration and, and then taking the inspiration from those tools and keeping it with yourself is a level of boosting your abstraction. So go out and look at Anki, how Anki does things. Go out and look at how Duo does things for a while. You know, take all these things and add it to your abstraction. So uh, the way I entertain myself with Duo is on my off time, I take ideas from other people and like uh, Anki users and Bushu users. And then I bring them, I bring them into Duolingo. 
And then when I'm done with Duolingo, I take Duolingo's thing and bring them into whatever I'm doing, like vlogs and whatnot. So when I'm watching anime, I'm thinking of funny things that Duolingo d does that anime doesn't do, for example. And when you're thinking about them, it reinforces what you're learning from Duolingo. And at the same time, when you're when I'm doing Duolingo, it reinforces what I'm learning from anime. So uh, that is also true when I'm learning other languages. So whatever I'm learning Chinese now, I'm thinking of Japanese. And I obviously think of English when I'm learning Chinese and Japanese. It's the natural state of my mind. I didn't grow up with one language. I grew up with three languages all the time. So um, when people are not used to growing up always constantly juggling these things, then it makes sense that they feel like it's unnecessary. So their natural approach would be to, if you want to acquire a target language, you only think and speak in that target language to enforce that. I don't, I don't resonate with that. I am constantly always thinking of more than one language. So my natural state is to keep that alive. That's how I engage. So if someone took English away from me, like Duolingo wouldn't do that because that's not part of its design. I would get, I would have to work harder as in work harder to bring English back in because I get in, I'm engaged in English and Japanese. So if little Duolingo, if I'm using a tool that doesn't use English, I'm still going to bring English back into the tool. It makes me work harder, which I might end up learning more at this point. Uh, since I have English here, I bring other English things into Japanese learning to keep myself engaged. All right. We just had a fun conversation about a uh, sample, sample my asa. <laughs> and without an understanding of English, that wouldn't have been as funny. After you get to a certain level, though, I think that immersing yourself in a language, any authentic content in given language becomes more beneficial as it doesn't tire you like Duo or Anki. I can see that. I disagree, but I can see that. Um, if you're talking about like learning how to be authentic, learning how to be authentic, then yes. Because if you don't do the thing that you strive to do, then yes, it would be more beneficial. Uh, nothing about Duo or Anki tires me because my goal is not authenticity. Uh, I think authenticity tends to be a very toxic, toxic uh, or unfeeling connecting word to me as a uh, what is authentic to me is literally the opposite of purist, purist perspective. So, um, what type of authentic content do I engage in in a given language? I engage in multicultural content. It's the most authentic version of multicultural content. It's purely not pure which is what the word authentic tends to involve. Someone who has a perspective of purity, not multiculturalism. So um, oftentimes things like duo, Anki, Bushu is a hybrid. They have bridging aspects of being both English and the native language and the target language. So that is the natural environment. It's the most authentic environment for me. So, yeah. It's understandable from someone who wants to be in one state of mind over another state of mind. That's very admirable. Very admirable. Um, the reason why I want to bring up the word authentic is 
What is your goal in learning Japanese? To learn Japanese to express myself in Japanese. If I can express myself in Japanese. Uh, I loosely use the word goal because it's not something that I have to achieve. I don't have to achieve the goal of learning Japanese. Right. What does that look like? The goal of learning. The goal in learning Japanese. What is the goal, right? Be able to express myself. And I'm already doing that. Uh, I do that every day. How do I express myself? I'm in English speaking Chinese speaking person who's learning Japanese. That is the goal. Right? <clears throat> to what extent? Whatever extent I imagine to myself. And then how people interpret it, uh, how I interpret that, that's up to them. Um, because you can't control how... You, you can try, you can try your best, but my goal is not to control what people think of my expression. It's cultural exchange. Um, my expression is a form of cultural exchange. Not a, a, a expression of cultural assimilation. When you think of authentic content, that's usually, in my opinion, from the perspective of cult cultural assimilation. I think it's uh, wonderful that other people like to immerse and, you know, assimilate a new culture as opposed to um, transforming, transforming in cultural exchange. It's kind of a, without saying too stereotypical, it's kind of an American thing, I suppose. To some extent. Ryokan, uh, ryokan de yoku, ryokan de, uh, yoku yasumimashita ka? Ya yasumimashita ka? Uh, did you? I believe it's beautiful that people constantly get exhausted by juggling different cultures and different languages as opposed to predicating or being uh, focused on the purity aspect of representation so that is only a personal choice and that's my background right i'm a person that is more or less an east meets west kind of thing as opposed to maybe a person who spends most of their life in a monocultural thing and then when they go to learn a different culture they also appropriately carry that same philosophy into truly respecting another culture and i totally get that so like i've met a lot of international people now who they're very proud of their heritage right and they live in a country where the truest essence and to pay respect to another country's cultural interests that they have is to embrace it for everything it is because in their current environment they would expect the same right if someone came to their country they would expect full assimilation into their country because of the monocultural monoculturalism that is very strong in their country um in the united states for me for my anecdotal experience is a mix of both so i sometimes uh, am in the environment of multi-generational Americans, which can flex between Germanic backgrounds, uh, Irish backgrounds, in, in my current state, Irish backgrounds, Germanic backgrounds, and Italian backgrounds. And then occasionally you get the Vietnamese and the Fujianese people. 
So it's natural for me to be thinking about it. What state am I in? I'm in Pennsylvania. I'm in Pennsylvania. So German, Irish, and Italian. And then the people who tend to move into the very specific area uh, may be Fujianese and Vietnamese as well. I've met a few Filipinos, but that's not significant. Yeah, and I spent uh, still a third of my life in Maryland, in the downtown, like the capital. And uh, I'm from New York, uh, New York City. Uh, did you, let's see, did you rest, <clears throat> rest, oh no, rest it did, wait, 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 oh yeah, did you, oh yeah, 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 <laughs> uh, did you rest well at the traditional inn? Semai deshita. Uh, to be to clarify both my parents are first generation so i am not necessarily the product of interracial uh, courtship right um both my parents are from china so i'm second gen i'm the second gen first gen born uh, ABC, if you will, uh, American born Chinese. Semai uh, Iriguchi deshita. It, uh, not here to gaslight anyone. I want to be, uh, I, I apologize if that came off as a little gaslighty. I, I'm, I tend to try to focus on saying, okay, okay, I, I don't want to like change up your lifestyle because I actually earnestly do believe that to be true. My parents, when I talk to my parents, it is very much like that. It's kind of weird because um, when you think of like pragmatism and how feasible things are, my parents would be like, Here, here's one comment that they would probably ask us like, why are you learning Japanese? You're not Japanese. That's kind of like the stuff that I'm, I'm not like offended by when my parents say that it's very reasonable that they would think that, like, why don't you learn Mandarin? And then they would ask, they, they would go further than that because of the monocultural, like pragmatism that they have, they would say, well, why do you even bother learning Mandarin? Just work on your English. Be better at English than ever. You're, you live in the United States, right? So that kind of thing can be... I'm very familiar with it. And I don't necessarily think it's offensive, right? It's oftentimes our life experiences really do uh, shape how we think. Why didn't I grow up with Mandarin? Because... Uh, my parents know that I was born in the United States and to be pragmatically very successful in the United States You must command the English language So much like the whole like authentic content and immersing myself My parents expect to Im Myself to immerse as much in the English language because I live in the United States So But you easily wield both you could easily will both. The answer is though. You you can for sure. Uh, the thing is when you when you come from a monocultural society, there's the right way to do things and the wrong way to do things. Any amount of time you're div. div dividing among a, a language that you don't pragmatically use in the country you are born in is less time you use to devote to specializing and authenticating the prag most pragmatic language 
This is the perspective of my parents. It's not an uncommon situation. It's really not. It's it's one of the most common. Actually, it's actually more the rule than the exception when it comes to at least the Asian, uh, the Chinese, uh, ABC situation. Yeah, yeah, but it happens a lot. Yeah, and just so you know, I am learning Mandarin. I'm trying my best to learn Mandarin now, as well. Um, it's been a long time coming, but my parents are perfectly comfortable with the idea that, yeah, we might not be able to express each other, express to each other by wielding our mother tongues, right? Um, but my parents see that if I, if they see me using English to an incredible uh, extent, um, they know that that is the compromise they made in life for my sister and I because uh, commanding English at an exceptionally high level gains access to certain things. Um, and for myself, it was one of the reasons. It was one of the bigger reasons. Um, and it was also mechanically relevant. When I was a kid, my parents don't speak. Like, my parents are not fluent in English. They are still not fluent to this day. In fact, they are largely illiterate to this day. So... Um, my sister and I pragmatically excelled at English in order to reach for primary. They focused on what they were able to do very well while we supplied the English. I still can, I'm still totally immersed in Fujianese with my parents though. You are half French and half German. I grew up speaking both languages. Now I'm fluent in both plus English. That's fantastic. Uh, again, my parents are all Chinese. They are not half anything, half like half this, half that. So um, culturally, they are monocultural in perspective. So when you're monocultural in perspective, you tend to take a rationally a monocultural approach to the pragmatism of language and since I live in the United States and I'm born as an American citizen honestly and unequivocally immersing in English is the most authentic way of being an American is how that's per perceived however for me I don't see myself as purely that's very unfortunate though in your opinion and I'm kind of curious why you think that you should immerse yourself in a language, any authentic content, because I actually think that's the opposite of being someone who is able to manage multilingualness. I'm not saying I am. That's the difference. I'm talking about the perspective of my parents and the perspective and mindset that I was raised upon in the household. For me, I actually know four languages to varying extents. And I actually do the opposite of what my parents do. Now, the question the you know, what promoted all of this conversation is the idea that you think that at some point it's you think that there's diminished return, like you must immerse yourself. You don't. I mean, I think it's unfortunate you didn't grow up speaking my mother tongue. I did grow up speaking my mother tongue. It's a mother tongue that's not being taught. So I speak Fujianese with my parents. Uh, not everyone grows up in a, in a country that has a language that is formally taught or instructed. So whether, whether I was able to learn uh my mother tongue yeah uh the mother tongue is that it's not it's not taught formally so i'm uh, my parents are diaspora from from fuzhou from fuzhou china so you can't learn any of that but i still speak that my parents can't speak english very well so it's not like i talk to my parents in english i i usually don't yeah. 
One thing I know is a lot on Chinese language subreddit is that there's a lot of heritage speakers who can speak and understand spoken but can't read. Yeah, I can't write or read in Chinese. But there's a lot of people trying resources, yeah. And and there just aren't any because the immersion that you're talking about, the authentic content, it's really simply not available to me. So it kind of thinks, I, I know. Like I want to be more expressive to my parents all the time. I talk about Fujianese quite a lot now, ex especially since now I'm talking about language learning. So I speak uh, 90 to 80 to 90% of the time I speak in Fujianese to my parents. Um, I can't read though. I can't read or write. And the only source of Fujianese is my parents or are my parents. Uh, there's no formal education for this outside of China. So you would actually literally have to be gr uh, raised and born and raised in China in order to have the luxury of speaking your mother tongue. And it's kind of like a unique situation or a, a lot of times it's a unique situation when it comes to uh, Chinese people in general, um, diaspora from China. You know, you can't have, there aren't any reasons. It's not to say that I wouldn't welcome it. I would love to meet another like Fujianese person and really, really get down nitty gritty. Most Chinese diaspora in the US and the rest of the world, interestingly, seems to come from, yep, Fujian and yep, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Uh, Zaijin. There's some Gondo, uh, Gondo area as well. And in the West Coast, since I'm on the East Coast, the West Coast tends to be, there's a, quite a lot of uh, Shanghainese, Shanghainese people. But Fujian is New York. It's like Fujian is solidly on the East Coast. Yeah. Yeah. Gondo. Uh, yeah. The Gondo. I, I don't know how to pronounce things in Mandarin. But yeah. The uh, Gondo region. Yeah. Go I, I'm like still kind of in a Japanese mode. But yeah. Gondo. Yeah. I would tell you how to. Oh, you're, you're talking about like. Yeah. That, that's fine. But you're stuck with chat. That's perfectly fine. Like I, I don't need to. Say, I'm not actually. So here's one thing. Right. Uh, Fujiu, Fujiu is how Fujian is said. So I'm toggling between both English, Fujianese, and what I know, ear training with Mandarin and Cantonese. So uh, there's going to be times where you might be thinking I'm trying to say something. If you're like someone interested in Mandarin, um, when I'm trying to say something, I'm not actually trying to say that thing. Like da, I'm not trying to say cha i'm trying to say da da is t so it can happen every once in a while right toggling in between that's that's kind of the nature of um having multiple languages right at least i don't know if you feel the same way you say you command three fluent languages so um, I imagine that you're in an environment where you constantly switch between the languages like mid sends and whatnot, because that's kind of my experience. My experience is that I habitually switch uh, in between sentences or like anywhere in the sentence. Uh, if you start a sentence with a specific structure, then you stay with that structure. Is Fujianese more related to Cantonese? That's a great question. And I don't know yet, um, cause earlier, right? Earlier I learned about nabe, right? Uh, I learned about uh, nabe, right? Nabe being hot pot, right? Being hot pot, but hot pot is different from shabu shabu, right? I'm gonna use uh, romaji now, just to be confusing. Shabu shabu. And then I I was like, you know what? I don't know what that is in Mandarin. So it's hua, hua guo. I don't know how to spell it yet because I don't know how to spell pinging. I'm working on it at the moment. Uh, it might be this. No. Uh, hua, uh, 
focal. Maybe like this. However, in Cantonese is Da Beno. Da Beno. Da I'm I'm gonna estimate. Da ben. Let's say Da Ben do do Da Beno. And then when I ask my parents, how do I say hot pot in Fujianese? Because I remember hearing it a bunch of times and I was like, I know this word. So they needed to remind me what it was. And it's Da Benu. So Da Benu. Da Ben Ben. I don't even know how to do that too. It's more like Da Benu. Da Benu. So I don't actually know. Uh, I have instances where when I hear the Cantonese word, it's like, oh yeah, I know exactly what the Fujianese word is. And then when, uh, you know, at some other word like, um, Da ah, is pretty good. T is pretty good. That's one of the first words you learn in Duolingo, by the way. Uh, cha, right? Cha is Da. This is what you would say. So, cha, da. Da is T. I, I don't know if that's closer to Cantonese. <laughs> I have no idea. And um, since I'm, in, I'm immersed, by the way, I'm immersed in Cantonese and Mandarin growing up. I can't... I can't, uh, like, sometimes I can't distinguish because I have no formal education. So I have, like, no structure system to separate the two. So occasionally I might say something that sounds more like Cantonese. Like, uh, Neko Matye versus, uh, Ni Shou Sama. Ni Shou Sama. Neko Matye. And, Ni Gong Sino. Nigong Sino is uh, Fujianese, so I don't know which one's closer. Ni Shou Shema versus Nigong Matye, Nigong Sino. I don't know which, uh, if Fujianese is closer to one or the other. It's it's kind of very confusing. And I would love for someone to like n use their observational skills in language to find that one day. Like, oh wait. Did you notice that whenever you use Fujianese, it kind of sounds like this sound system in Cantonese, but not so much Mandarin. I haven't ever had a discussion like that before. And largely when I set those phrases, those are very common phrases that I say. So I don't really think about having to figure out how to say them. I just say them, right? So is that considered fluency? I don't think so, in my opinion. Personally, strictly speaking, uh, immersion produces something that is different from learning like this. Learning like this is a very different aspect, right? Obviously. And it may lead to uh, proficiencies that are different zones, different like zones of fluency and particular things that come out a little bit differently when it comes to purely doing something versus purely doing something else my think this gab asking you wait what do you mean by this gab asking you yeah we're talking about uh i'm actually having the privilege of talking to someone who's actually very multilingual that's pretty sweet i actually haven't met someone uh, I rare it's a lot rarer to meet someone who has two uh two parents right like what I mean is like two parents from different like parents from different origin and also that person ends up retaining both the languages and at the same time acquiring a second language to the same level so that's pretty sweet, actually. Gregor. That's incredibly impressive. Um, in the Chinese culture, this is more of a cultural dissonance now. In the Chinese culture, it's predicated on pragmatism. 
it's it's predicated on pragmatism so um i don't feel regretful or unfortunate towards my parents for pushing me into english because i respect that that's what they think and they want to give up the expressive connection that we might otherwise have if i continue to maintain my mandarin however mandarin resources does not come about very accessibly the age that i grew i'm 37 i grew up in a time where um i grew up in a social economic environment and a time when mandarin is not something that is both equally presentable in a high level while also being able to have access to higher education and incredible uh, resource uh, resource friendly universities and stuff while still having access to mandarin so most of the time english has taken its place so and now i'm going back it's actually kind of fun I, I what I mean is I love that I now we live in an age where we can say things like, oh yeah, Duolingo is not exciting. Let's go to Anki, and then Anki is not exciting. Let's let's go. To, I we live in an unprecedented time of globalization and flexibility. Uh, when I was a kid, it's nice to have something to eat. And, you know, go to a school that is actually remotely teaching something and then going to a place where like, oh, everyone around you is uh, incredibly accelerated. And in order to compete, you must forego your mother tongue in order to compete. Right. I should have a big advantage learning Mandarin, knowing Fujianese. It kind of feels that way. I also and what I mean by that is uh, the advantage is that I feel very comfortable. And then I can leverage that comfortability to apply myself harder. So there's a lot of associations that I can leverage to make it a nice process, which I will be doing later once I finish the lessons for Japanese, right? So I'm starting with Japanese because it's very far removed from everything. And then Mandarin is next. I actually educate, I'm actually formally educated in Spanish, actually. The second formal education, educated language that I have is actually Spanish, which I'll get to that in, at some point, maybe in a year's time, <laughs> revisiting Spanish. Your biggest complaint about Mandarin compared to Japanese is that there's no indicator if something is a verb, adjective, or noun. I just don't, I, I don't even know how, what to say about that, Jacob, at the moment, because I don't. We, I only got through the first lesson. There's not even a sentence yet. <laughs> it's a, I wasn't aware there's no indicator for verb, adjective, or noun. Is there one? Oh, from Japanese. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. From Japanese. If you're comparing it to Japanese. Yeah. Yeah, no indicators. Yeah, there, yeah there's no indicators. Now that I think about it. Uh, yeah there's no there's no endings no no endings They're like no no indicators for for the stuff it, it's just vanilla kind, kind of like english actually <laughs> i that's that's a fun way to tell my parents actually that you know what I guess there's like gerunds. In English, there's gerunds, right? Gerunds can be a loose way of marking in action, but it's they're like well in between. Um, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I love these discussions. Sorry, sorry. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the candidness, Gregor. That is pretty exceptional to to be so well inclined i would love i mean i don't know if you make content or anything i i love watching people uh slip in and out of languages like my favorite thing is always uh is watching uh multicultural couples 
slip in and out of languages. So like at one time you, you can, it, it's so adorable. I find it super endearing. Like someone would say something like, wait, you're not doing it. And then suddenly the word that they want to impact, it, it suddenly changes to their, like whatever language they decide. Like, uh, what'd you call it? Uh, I don't know. Um, can I use some of my, uh, something like, oh man, that's so abunai. <laughs> like, no, 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 no. Uh, yamate, yamate. <laughs> okay, it's like, uh, okay, all right. It, we're like, eto, eto. I, I like this. I, I like this tabem, tabemono. <laughs> I, I love that. Like that, that stuff, in, in my opinion, is like the essence. It's capturing the essence of how it feels very comfortable to be in languages. Like you don't, uh, you don't automatically start thinking, I need to switch to a mode. You just end up doing it anyways for accenting. Uh, sometimes, you know, I say a lot of times like, man, this is, uh, this is definitely no bueno. Like, mm-mm, mm-mm. Like, what do you think about this? Nadie. No, nada. Nada, nadie, nilch. <laughs> not right now. <laughs> Let's not go there. I'm not touching that. All right. Uh, cool, cool. All right, all right. I'm going to refocus and try. Actually, are you interested in learning Japanese or Mandarin? Uh, or are you already learning Japanese or Mandarin? Jacob is both, honestly. Jacob is like hardcore immersion tied for Japanese at this point, and then um, dabbling in Mandarin. Not dabbling. I think Jacob's gonna knock Mandarin out of the park. I'm playing catch up. <laughs> as, as a, uh, as a American born Chinese, I'm trying to catch up to Jacob in Mandarin. Imagine that. Imagine that. Semai. <clears throat> so, semai. Uh, semai irikuchi. Irikuchi dashita. Dashita. So it was a cramped entrance. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> tatami de nemashita. Tatami. Uh, tatami de nema, uh, nemashita. Oh, that sounds so comfortable. Sleeping on top of a tatami. I kind of, I'm a floor sleeper, so occasionally i just need some like slight give but i'm i'm very much a floor sleeper uh we slept on the traditional flooring the tatami actually i rarely say traditional flooring when it comes to describing tatami actually tatami is the english word what i mean is uh uh it's kind of like uh sushi right sushi uh, tempura. When you uh, describe sleeping on a specific floor, it's tatami. Uh, although in English, the accent would be tatami, tatami. Right, tatami. So just to, it, it's kind of like how katakana is. So when you go to Japan, you're probably gonna use katakana to pronounce English words. In the United States, I would more likely say Atami so that it's identifiable by English speaker. Like sushi and uh oh no, I don't even know how to say tempura. Tempura. Right? Tempura. Uh sometimes ramen. <laughs> no, 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 no. Not not a lot of people say ramen. They, these days they say ramen. It's a ramen. Right, and so ramen. Whenever I'm not able to express my current thoughts as well in one language than uh, the other, I will tend to switch only under the condition that the listener also knows both. Yeah, fair enough. Yep, exactly. Whichever comes first. 
I, I I do the whole um if if appropriate I, I agree with you if appropriate like with a strange uh, with with someone right if appropriate whichever comes first yeah right whichever comes first or with lo lowest path of resistance right lowest path of resistance um for my parents I do whichever comes first um because uh, my inclination is that if my parents are um, fluent in the language that I started with in the expression that if I substituted an English word they will not only understand the contextual nature of the English word but they also gain that English word over time so there over time my parents use words like school hospital uh shopping um grocery grocery store um in fact um they replaced they adopted the word giant for supa or a supermarket or a grocery store even though the phrase is chine uh chine chidun chine chidun right but they would use giant and giant is actually like a kleenex a Kleenex situation, a Kleenex situation. Like um, lots of Americans would say Kleenex, but Kleenex are tissues, right? Tissues would be something you use internationally. However, uh, you can say Kleenex in the United States and people will know it's tissues. Giant is the local, local uh, grocery store. So now my parents would use giant when they're referring to a local grocery store, which then you would know that uh, this is a familect, right? I'm talking about familex now, where you have a family, a close circle, family induced dialects. So the Fujianese now, uh, since Fujianese is not uh, inter like formally educated, um, most of my Fujianese is also familect dependent. So when I talk to another person, the rare moment I talk to another person who knows Fujianese, uh, they will also have products of Familex. And because of that, it's very interesting to talk to other Fujianese people that are diaspora because their Familex would be different. And then um, a lot of times this is different from having an accent from actual Fujianese people who are from Fujian, right, in the Chinese. Every uh, diaspora diaspora um, in a foreign language will have different familex of their mother tongue. So it's a, it becomes a very strong bonding moment. Um, like, oh, that's how you say it. I'm like, well, I say it this way. It's like, oh, well, that's weird. It's like, oh, yeah, that's weird too. Like, you say this, and I'm like, uh, there are some consistencies, like, uh, here's something like in Fujian. I, I imagine Fujian people in Fujian know how to like say hello in a specific way or know how to say goodbye in a specific way. But oftentimes, when you talk about people like me, the, the diaspora, um, we use phrases um, to express these things, but they're no longer the same phrases. There's still phrases that are shared between. There are common phrases that are shared between each one, but they vary even then. So the diaspora still retains some sort of phrasing that is common. And then there's the familex stuff, where then um, you have certain things that kind of grew out of this. Like, for example, busy, 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 busy is a uh loan word uh, well like loan word in the sense of like katakana is in japanese so nia busy ma nia busy ma this is no longer in english word it is a fujo fujanese uh fujanese loan word busy busy not busy 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 nia busy ma so when I'm saying ni busy ma, I'm not saying are you 
busy, which busy would be how I pronounce it in the in American, in American English. So occasionally when I say busy, um, busy, busy can sound weird because I might be thinking of the Fujianese pronunciation as opposed to busy, the American pronunciation, things like that. Super interesting. Very interesting. All right. Uh, school. School is how you would say uh, school. I, it's kind of hard. It's like school. School is how my parents, the family act for, for um, expressing school. So when I talk to people and say, oh, I'm heading to school now. I would say I'm heading to school now between me and my sister, but school, school is how I would say to my parents, like, oh, why call school now? Why call? And I said now, why call school now as opposed to why call school, jirung why call school? Something like that, right? It, it's so, <laughs> it keeps going. I. I, it, it, I, I love seeing this, like um, when people record interactions with their family, like, oh yeah, my mother from Korea who's coming to the United States and I'm American and we're having, uh, we're making food and then you see the recording, right? Like they're recording themselves um, cooking and stuff and how they communicate. It's so like that is, it, uh, it makes me feel at home. like. The interactions when I see when people have parents from a different place and then they are adopting another place and they're married to another uh, to another person from a different place and then they make content that is like it's more it's slightly more common now however they do draw a lot of criticism right there's gonna be lots of comments like oh that's not how Chinese people behave or that's not how Americans behave so you get a lot of that in on the internet because it's predicated on statistics Whichever one has the either the loudest Regardless if it's minority the loudest voice tends to be the one that gets over gets represented and I am a person who really loves capturing whenever I see the rare opportunity to see another group that and capture what I feel or how I am at home with my parents. I am home with my parents. Those moments are indescribable. They have to be demonstrated because I think still the vast majority of people on this planet operates in a monocultural mindset, not in a multicultural mindset. And that's kind of how humans, it's the human condition. You want to belong in places and rules and structure and expectation creates consistency. It feels very comfortable. Unfortunately, I, I'm born, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm born in circumstances that makes me a vast minority. You feel like you're the opposite of that. So you want to belong in, so you want to like, uh, strive yourself to belong in like where separate where I, I'm not, I'm not saying this in like a superficial way, but like donning different masks when appropriately. So you like the appropriateness of it. Oh, opposite of monocultural. Oh, okay. You feel like you're the opposite. Of oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 I see. Uh, I agree. Then you and I would probably resonate pretty well because I'm pretty opposite of that. I think there's a hyper hyper representation of people wanting to be to fit in and that's a great thing I think it, it pr promotes community at the same time you can't help but also want to do the same sort of like the monocultural aspect but at the same time collect all the multicultural aspects right like bond with other multicultural people and that can be tougher 
largely due to the nature of how rare it can be because you have to have two or three things happen at the same time rather than like you, ha you have to have more things line up than fewer things line up and statistically you know in math it's more likely that being uh, you're more likely to be born and raised in a certain manner than having three or four things happen and then those things have to line up with someone else's in order to feel like resonating but when they happen it's magic i i think it's magical um it's even more so when say i've met i don't know if jacob is still here because jacob is always hard working uh jacob uh shared with me that He's in a very specific situation and because of that situation we un we very scarily relate in perspective a lot and that kind of thing is like you don't even have to talk about it. it's like yeah <laughs> that's fine i do believe that mind to some extent is important to have it is indeed it is i think both right the answer is both not one or the other right and it's ironic because uh, it's kind of paradoxical because my answer to multiculturalism is the likely one of the influences for me to say it's both. There's room for both. Like uh, there's room for more than one language. There's more. There's room for more than one cultural awareness, even while trying to segregate them. Right, even while you're trying attempting to segregate them, being aware that both, mo uh, being aware that there are two monocultural places, as opposed to one multicultural places that are a mix of two monocultural places. Those are three separate states of mind. Culture one, culture two, and a culture that's a mix of one and two. Those are, they coexist. Right, they exist and definitely so not i'm not you know i i have to keep this in mind when i'm wherever i'm talking to people that's kind of the awareness factor excellent point excellent point 